Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. South Africa took two highly controversial energy decisions this week, which could have long-term ramifications. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss the approval of a refinery partnership, as well as the decision to launch a procurement process for 2,500 megawatts of nuclear. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Firstly, Cabinet has approved a proposed partnership to support the restart of the mothballed gas to liquids refinery in Mossel Bay. Yes, that's correct. You know, Mossel Bay refinery goes back to the old apartheid days, the Moss Gas Project, when we were trying to bust sanctions or create the indigenous fuel sources. It's not a very large refinery and its modest size is somewhat linked to the fairly modest size of the gas field that was originally built on. So it's a gas to liquids refinery. It, it takes the gas, the natural gas, and converts it into mostly fuels in the old days, but also some chemicals. But it, and its gas source has been, was dwindling for many, many years. And there was a project, a billion dollar project, Project Equesi, to try to uh, firm up a new sources of gas for the refinery. And that failed dismally, um, le leaving the Petro SA in serious, uh, having to write off 14 billion rand in a serious financial predicament uh, and having to mothball the, the gas to liquids refinery. There's been attempts to try and bring in imported gas, which have been fraughted one on cost, but also on the fact that the seas in that level make it difficult for a floating storage facility or regasification facility. So that, that's always been a problem. They looked at using condensates um, uh, as an alternative. Uh, but now they're looking again for gas, a gas source. And what Cabinet has approved is to reinstate the gas to liquids refinery. They're looking for a partner that will do the investment that is needed on this facility because a lot of the, the f uh, as you decommission or mothball a facility, put in care maintenance, a lot of the components start you know, decaying. Uh, you need to have that thing, uh, have the plant operating. That's the best practice. They want to get it operational again do the investment, the investments estimate about $200 million uh, to do that. And then they need a, a partner that will ensure the, uh, the gas supply. So they've went through a, a tender process. Apparently, according to Amabungani, 20 bids were submitted. But the way the tender was crafted, it seems all but one was disqualified during that bidding process. And that one happens to be uh, gas, Gazprom uh, Bank Africa. And uh, that is what Cabinet approved, that they can move ahead to try and get uh, this, this proposed partnership to a final investment decision. And they've given them until, well, the, 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 the sort of deadline given is by April, they must get to that point, and then there'll be a process of financial close, and then uh, the sort of engineering and construction works that won't be necessary, and the gas supply and start producing at the refinery again 18 months thereafter. What did the government have to say about the fact that it will be partnering with a Russian company amid ongoing sanctions? So this was a part of a sort of a, a due diligence exercise that Petrosa had to run. And they looked at the sanction issue. Uh, it, I think it is a major issue, particularly because Petrosa has other partnerships. They were wanting to sort of link in with Total Energies, who have got, we know, found the Brillpad and the Leopard, Leopan uh, offshore gas resources which aren't, are very far from production. Uh, and there's, there's questions as to whether they ever will be in production. But be that as it may, that, that's a company that comes from the European Union that has imposed sanctions on Russia. They've also had partners over the years with American companies. Uh, we know that the Americans have imposed sanctions on, on Russia since the invasion on, on Ukraine. Uh, their response, uh, and government and cabinet has endorsed this response, is that these primary sanctions apply to European and American companies and citizens and don't apply uh, to uh, countries outside that. Their second response is that other countries continue to trade in uh, energy, uh, energy, food and medicines with Russia uh, because those are exempt, especially where energy is seen as a, a critical energy source. And they claim that this is a critical energy source given that our refinery fleet is, is closing down steadily and we're having to import more and more fuel. Uh, and they then say that the threat of secondary sanctions, which is what this would be, uh, is low because all the sanctions so far have been on a primary level. 
and there haven't been any impositions on a secondary sanctions basis. But they putting their toe in the water or <laughs> they're t stepping where angels fear to uh, and we'll have to see whether that's really the case. But that's the argument, that they don't think there's much risk. Uh, they note that India and China both are trading, uh, continue to trade with Russia in energy and uh, as part of a BRICS country we're wanting to increase our uh, trade and investment ties with countries in the BRICS bloc, including Russia. Then it was also announced that the regulator has given its backing for the procurement of 2,500 megawatts of new nuclear capacity. Yes, so this uh, has been knocking around for some time. The Integrated Resource Plan of 2019 was published in October of that year. Uh, and nuclear is actually not in the table uh, of allocations of technologies. Uh, table 5 in the Integrated Resource Plan, but it is mentioned in something called Decision 8 that we will we'll investigate nuclear and invest in a least regret way uh, at a pace and scale that the country can afford. So, uh, for some reason, uh, the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, Gwede Mantash, felt that was sufficient to publish a determination to initiate procurement and did that. Uh, the, the regulator, NERSA, raised su certain sus suspensive conditions before that determination could be properly gazetted and move ahead towards procurement. Uh, you know, things like uh, doing an analysis of whether this will fit into the system, an affordability sort of s uh, uh, test, as well as that it be operated on EPC principles when it is goes into procurement so that it's uh, to lower the risk of any nuclear build program. As we know, the, the not going the EPC route at Madupe and Kassili has been disastrous. So those were some of the sus suspensive conditions. Those apparently uh, DMRE has now in the regulator's eyes met and they have got concurrence for the determination. And therefore they say they're going to launch before March next year a request for proposals for nuclear vendors uh, to bid for this allocation of 2,500 megawatts. They at this stage haven't designed the tender, so they're not saying whether it's going to be conventional technology, you know, like pressurised water reactors like we have at Kuburg, which are generally large units, large units, large reactor units, or these small-scale uh, modular technologies. They're kind of saying they're going to be open, um, and they're going to be encouraging all bidders uh, to come forward. So th this is what's now happened. We haven't seen either the uh, NERSA concurrence nor the new determination, but apparently th those are going to be gazetted quite soon. This has also raised many questions. It's raising many, many questions. Uh, one, as I mentioned, you know, this is a post-2030 type activity, therefore it's not covered in the Integrated Resource Plan allocation. Secondly, we're undergoing a review of the RP 2019 and Government is just about to gazette what they call RP 2023, even though it's really going to be 2024. Um, and that's going to go into the public domain for public comment. And obviously nuclear and the role of nuclear in the, the two horizons that they say are in this plan is going to feature in some way in the first horizon, the Kuburg life extension, which has itself been something of a disaster. And in the second horizon, probably this 2,500 megahertz, possibly more, we'll, we'll have to see at horizons from 2031 to 2050, but we haven't seen it. So this is a public engagement. There's going to be, you know, you need to understand what this could mean. Does this fit into our future system that's going to be dominated by uh, variable renewable energy? There's a lot of questions of whether there's a business case for these sort of large, either on or off type uh, reactors and, uh, or, or type power stations in the future where the cheapest and the workhorse electrons are coming from these variable sources and are generally overbuilt and you generally want a gap filler, not something that stays on all the time. You want something flexible like a pumped hydro scheme or a battery storage scheme or even gas to power that can come on quickly and respond to those gaps, not that just sits there and adds and if it's, uh, you know, adds to potentially to the cost of the system because when it's on, it's on and when it's off, it has to be covered by everything else. So that's the business case is going to be interrogated during this process for nuclear in the, such a system. The affordability of nuclear is definitely going to be uh, discussed. We're going to see what technology cost assumptions 
are built into this IRP 2023. And uh, the technology cost assumptions have to be based on what's happening internationally. And internationally, uh, nuclear is not in, not in the ballpark, especially the, the small modular reactors, which are still in sort of a, a pre-commercial type phase. And we're seeing a lot of some of these companies falling over, particularly in America at the moment. So it's very controversial from a business case, timing-wise, because we've got this integrated resource plan. And it's, it's extremely controversial in response to load shedding, because this is the burning platform. We need to be building new capacity that can respond to this and to respond to the failure of the base load fleet, these, these rectangular blocks that are just either on or off the coal fleet. And we need to do that as much as possible with the cheapest technology, which is no, is wind, solar, backed with some sort of flexible generation. And that's just not happening at the pace that we need it to be happening. And that really should be the priority. We've got a technology that's not going to respond to the load shedding crisis because realistically, they say 10 years, but realistically 15 years gestation period for something like this. So that takes us deep into the 2030s. Hopefully, we have to hope by then that load shedding crisis is behind us. And also the system's gonna look so different, as I say, so will the business case be there? So it's very controversial. The timing is raising all sorts of questions. And I think there's going to be a lot of pushback. And as with other programs that, that don't make rational sense, like the car, the car power ship, you know, having 20 year emergency floating gas to power projects, or not projects, but uh, fleets sitting in your harbors for 30 years when you're supposed to be responding to an emergency. Again, that doesn't make rational sense, so it goes to the courts. So I think here too, we must expect there's going to be some legal pushback on such an irrational, ill-timed decision. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.